good evening to everyone uh, in India and good morning to everyone in the US. Uh, the topic for today's discussion is uh, parsing Biden administration's Indo-Pacific policy, uh, where we'll try and look at Biden administration's recently released Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, the Biden administration has brought out its Indo-Pacific policy recently on 11th February. Uh, so in today's discussion, we will try and explore what uh, the U.S. Uh, policy is trying to achieve through its Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, the timing of the document, uh, how it is different from uh, President Trump's approach, uh, what it means for the Quad cooperation, its relevance vis-a-vis -vis the United States' China stra strategy and uh, other issues. Of course, we will also try and uh, touch upon Ukraine and what it means uh, for the timing uh, of the document. To do this, we have a fantastic lineup of people uh, whose work, including on issues in the Indo-Pacific, I have closely followed. Um, so with that, uh, let me start uh, today's discussion. Uh, Nilanti, let me uh, turn to you and ask you about what do you make up uh, of this Indo-Pacific strategy of the Biden administration uh, for uh, the region, uh, the importance of the timing, uh, and what does it mean for India, if you can touch upon, and also in littoral countries of the Indian Ocean? Okay, uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Vivek, for your invitation to be here. My thanks also to ORF and the opportunity to share some views from my personal research. I'll speak to five takeaways from my read of the Indo-Pacific strategy. So first, I was reading it to see the treatment of the Indian Ocean, essentially that segment of the wider Indo-Pacific. There were some questions during the last administration about how the U.S. sees the Indian Ocean, its geographic boundaries, and to what extent these should align with India's vision. And it's essentially a question about the Western Indian Ocean and whether the U.S. should take a more expansive view of the Indo-Pacific. And... I thought it was interesting to see in the 2015 maritime security strategy put out by the MOD Indian Navy an expansion of its own vision to identify the entire Indian Ocean as its primary area of interest. This was a change from the previous document. But the U.S., it's further away and the conception of the Indian Ocean more limited from the western boundary of India to the west coast of the United States. And this represents U.S. defense planning for the Indo-Pacific Command. It's a region that U.S. officials often talk about as spanning from Hollywood to Bollywood. But the Deputy National Security Advisor, Matt Pottinger, when he was in India for the 2020 Racina Dialogue, it was intriguing to see how he mentioned, he, he calls it from California to Kilimanjaro essentially extending to East Africa and spanning the entire Indian Ocean and suggesting potentially that U.S. and Indian perspectives of the Indian Ocean could align. But I think the Indo-Pacific strategy document answers that question from Hollywood to Bollywood prevails. And I think it does it in two ways. First is just through looking at the cover map and the geographic boundaries uh, indicated on the map. But section, second are through mentions of the Indian Ocean itself. There are only two in the entire document. The first is a really a geographic reference talking about the region stretching from our Pacific coastline to the Indian Ocean. But then the second is connecting India and the Indian Ocean, talking about the need to support India's continued rise, how India is a like-minded partner and leader in South Asia and the Indian Ocean. So essentially that continental focus with South Asia and then the maritime domain focus with the Indian Ocean. And then that's it. So for all of the increased attention to the Indian Ocean in recent years, the story is about the Indo-Pacific and not the Indian Ocean. And this leads me to my second point, which is U.S. identity and essentially evolving identity and articulation of national interests. Over the past decade in U.S. strategy documents, it's been interesting to see the evolution of the terms used. So going back uh, a decade ago, uh, talking about the Asia Pacific, which was a phrase used for many years 
And then morphing that slightly to talk about the Indo-Asia Pacific, essentially identifying India as an important partner uh, to the United States and the Indian Ocean increasingly in that vision. And then to where it is now with the Indo-Pacific, a mostly maritime conception of the region. And then also Washington applying this normative layer, this free and open vision also to the region. And so you can trace the evolution if you look at the Pentagon's uh, uh, Indo-Pacific Strategy Report in June of 2019, it talked about how the Indo-Pacific is the Department of Defense's priority theater, but in terms of identity, it still mentioned how the U.S. is a Pacific nation. And so this is a, a, a phrase that has been used for years by officials, not, not just in that document, but it's, it's a good example of it. But then we started to see a transition just a few months later with the State Department's free and open Indo-Pacific document, where it mentioned the U.S. is and always will be an Indo-Pacific nation. And so now in a new administration, we're seeing this with this new strategy document. It mentioned how the U.S. is an Indo-Pacific power. So that evolution in terms of the U.S.'s identity, I think it is a noteworthy one. And it, it was interesting, though, to see in the background press call that was released in association with the strategy, uh, this uh, the, the leader uh, or the official uh, kind of reverted back to the talking point of uh, the U.S. being a Pacific nation. That, that was mentioned two times. And then this leads me to my third point, which is that the Indian Ocean is not the Pacific. And that may seem obvious, but I think it's worth noting that clearly there has been a trend to combine the two theaters, as we've seen most recently with the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. But even as the Indian Ocean has ostensibly assumed greater importance in U.S. strategy through its incorporation into this Indo-Pacific concept, I would argue that the U.S. continues to understand the region through a Pacific lens and its Pacific identity. And I think this risks overlooking some of the unique features of the Indian Ocean and its relative stability, contrasting it to the contestation and assertiveness as we've seen in the Pacific and potentially a war fighting theater for the United States. And then fourth, I thought it was interesting to note the references to Europe in this document. France is mentioned, the UK is mentioned, the EU. And I think this is in contrast to the State Department's free and open document from 2019, where there was no mention of France, no mention of the UK, and just one passing reference to the EU with regard to the Blue Dot Network. And then finally, my fifth point, it was interesting to see this mention of the Indo-Pacific economic framework. Uh, essentially, I, I flashed back thinking about a decade ago to the Indo-Pacific economic corridor, uh, essentially right after the pivot and the rebalance uh, was announced. And this idea that U.S. officials were talking about at the time, essentially trying to link South Asia and Southeast Asia, trying to connect South Asia to the, the economic gains uh, from Southeast Asia, and trying to improve uh, regional immigration where it's uh, traditionally low in South Asia. And so it was interesting, you would see US officials speak about IPAC in India, also when they went to Bangladesh and highlighting Bangladesh's role in connecting South Asia and Southeast Asia. So it's interesting, again, to see this resurgence of a of an economic focus when we're thinking about the Indo-Pacific region. This effort sounds uh, a bit more modern. It's, it's talking about technology and the energy and climate nexus, but it's, it's still, it's noteworthy that there is a clear policy focus now on, on the economics and, and, and a resurgence of that. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Nilanti, for those, uh, for a very expansive range of uh, coverage there. Um, I, I'm sure we'll get uh, some views on, on uh, most of these by Dhruva and Shruti. Uh, but I think, in, uh, you know, just by the mention of it, I think uh, the focus on expanding the US, Japan and ROK cooperation, which is uh, mentioned in the implementation strategy, certainly stands out to the fact that the US is geared towards maintaining a strong Pacific theater. Uh, uh, we will come to your other points, but let me first invite um, our next panelist, uh, Dhruva. Um, so again, the same questions. What do you 
uh, your initial thoughts on what you make of the Biden administration's strategy uh, and you know what is the policy relevance for India. But also, I would I would want to get your views on uh, the Quad itself. I mean, if you find if you look at the document, it has been mentioned about thirteen times, uh, and it came uh, it was brought. Uh, right uh, a day after the quad ministers meeting. So uh, how does that all add up together? Dhruva? Sure. Yeah, no, I had, uh, I mean, broadly speaking, I, I didn't, uh, going through the document, I wasn't particularly surprised one way or the other. I don't think there was anything uh, there that uh, stood out uh, that, you know, that that was not expected from based on prior statements and speeches, particularly uh, US Secretary of State Tony Blinken's speech in Jakarta, which largely laid out the same points, in fact, in a very similar uh, style. I'm going to just uh, look at it. I would look at it in three ways. Uh, one is sort of geographically. Uh, second is sort of, sort of thematically. Uh, just a few key points on that. And then the third, just, you know, to add a little bit of inside gossip and stuff like that. So some of the personalities involved, because I do think so, it reflects in some ways the personalities of people who help draft it. On the geographical front, I think there were four broad audiences uh, to this. The first, uh, or some, the messaging was really intended for different categories of groups. One is China, and very clearly there's a China focus up front in, in, the, in the first few, first few pages. It, it clearly says China is the main challenge. They mention climate change and other things, but really the, the, the largest geopolitical challenge in the region is China from a US standpoint. So that's very you know, front and center. Uh, the, in background, uh, U.S. officials uh, have been repeatedly saying that this is not the extent of our China strategy, that we think of the China threat as a, as a global one, a global challenge for the U.S., uh, covering multiple domains, international institutions, and the Indo-Pacific is just one area, perhaps the most important area, where, where this, uh, the U.S.-China competition is playing out. The second is uh, India, and as many have noted, you know, there, there's a sort of un- uh, unreserved uh, enthusiasm for the U.S.-India strategic partnership and for deepening it uh, for major defense partnership uh, in multiple dimensions. The Quad, as you mentioned, is is, is a major point of focus of which India is one of the four uh, participating members. Um, so that's just, I think, a clear one that India is seen as a key long-term partner and, and putting that in writing, I think, was important. The third is the, uh, ally, the, the more traditional U.S. allies, uh, particularly Japan and South Korea and their uh, seeming inability to work together over, over smaller differences. So there's clearly uh, not so subtle mentions of, sort of bringing Japan and South Korea together, uh, repairing the divides between them, but also other allies, including Australia, the U.K. Uh, and, and, and European partners, as Nilanti mentioned. Um, the fourth is actually uh, just about everybody else. And in some ways, you know, there's this, there is a keenness on their part, as there are with other Quad partners, to provide an affirmative vision for the Quad and for the Indo-Pacific. And a lot of it is about showing this is not going to be a militarized Cold War style standoff. We are going to uh, acknowledge, be, be, uh, we're going to acknowledge your sensitivities. We're not going to uh, force you to make decisions, but we're going to uh, offer sort of attractive uh, terms of engagement. And that really seemed to be directed largely at Southeast Asia, the South Pacific countries, smaller South Asian states, uh, and, and uh, other actors in the region who are concerned about the growing geopolitical tensions between particularly the US and China. So in some ways, I, I think we had all four of those themes, you know, China as the major competitor, India as a main emerging partner, uh, maintaining and reinforcing alliances, and also ensuring a, a sort of a affirmative vision uh, and uh, engagement with with the other parties. So that's on the geographic side. On the on the thematic side, I would say there are two things: a plus and a minus. The plus was there was a very big emphasis on technology. Uh, that's sort of a running theme throughout, including through AUKUS on uh, a, a number of issues of uh, um, technological supply chains. Uh, of 5G, 6G standards. I mean, these were, these were the kinds of things that, that permeated the document in terms of U.S. engagement with the region. So there's a very, very, much, very, there's a very strong uh, focus on, on emerging technologies, and that fits the Quad's uh, mandate. By all accounts, the, the Working Group on Critical and Emerging Technologies is actually the one that has been the most productive uh, conversation over the last few years. Um, so I think that that's on the plus side. On the minus side, uh, as Nilanthi uh, alluded to as well, there, there seem to be very only very vague mentions on the economic uh, side, uh, in particular this reference to the Indo-Pacific 
um, uh, economic uh, plan that, that are expected to be expected to get more details in the next few months. Now, uh, the problem, I think the dilemma facing the Biden administration on this is that uh, they want to play a bigger economic role, but are uh, unable to uh, for domestic reasons and, and both amongst Democrats and amongst Republicans. There's a great concern about entering into new trade agreements that would require uh, uh, granting more market access to others of, or to the United States. Um, so I think the challenge is how do you uh, from the from from their point of view, how do you extend the uh, qualitative um, uh, standards and norms that are in something like TPP, the Tr Tr trans Pacific Partnership, now CPTPP, uh, without giving in to any of the, mar uh, uh, the market access issues. And that's actually a very uh, tricky dilemma, and it may not be sufficient, it may not be what any of the partners want or like. Um, uh, you know, from their point of view, it sort of raises the costs for, for them without actually any of the benefits of market access to the US. So I think that the that's a very tricky needle just because the, the domestic politics uh, is so firmly against uh, providing greater market access to uh, to others, including friendly countries, vis-a-vis -vis sort of the need to actually engage with the uh, more deeply with the Indo-Pacific region economically. And so we'll see how they thread that needle over the coming months. Um, the final question uh, is about you know uh, issues re really related to personalities, as I mentioned, but that that's not just a frivolous uh, thing. It actually relates to the sustainability of the Indo-Pacific Initiative. So on the plus side, you have here a democratic administration. Many people thought that they would not be interested in uh, a more confrontational or competitive approach to China, very clearly spelling out something like that. In that sense, it represents broad bipartisan co continuity with the Trump administration that really put forward. Uh, pu pu push the Indo-Pacific agenda. Um, but uh, I think there's still deep divides, uh, both amongst Democrats and Republicans, but for, for in the near term um, uh, within the Democratic Party. And so this does reflect, in some ways, the viewpoints of uh, the people currently in uh, the, the White House, uh, and to a lesser degree, the State Department, um, and, and the staff uh, ar around them. And so I think it is an open question as to whether another Democratic administration, or if there's a change in personnel in the next year or two, when, how uh, enthusiastic they will be about pushing this forward. And of course, much more open questions after what happens after 2024, uh, when the next presidential election takes place. So um, I do think that that, that that is there. I mean, you, you do have people, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, spent a lot of time in Australia. Um, Kurt Campbell, the Indo-Pacific Coordinator, uh, you know, has long time support of the US-Japan Alliance, uh, led a dialogue with India, a track to dialogue in India back in 2004-05. I mean, so it was a long time uh, in, interested. And so if, if some of the people around, the, the, they and some of the people around them were to change, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting question as to how much of this will be sustained in, uh, in future years. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to the discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Dhruva, for some incisive comments and really reading between the lines on, on the trade issues and market access uh, issues. Um, uh, let me now, uh, I'll come back to you with, uh, with more questions, but let me now move to Shruti um, and get her views on uh, uh, what does she make of the Biden administration's in Indo-Pacific strategy, um, relevance of India, and of course, given your work on China, I think how does that strategy approach specific security itself and how do you look at the emerging security archi architecture which has been talked about in the document uh, Shruti. thanks uh, hi vivek thank you and it's great to be on this panel with such fantastic speakers i think a lot of the ground has already been covered by both nilanti and Dhruva on the strategy and you know i would uh, have very little to differ from what they've said but quickly to add a few more thoughts i mean first off sitting in new delhi i think the commentariat has been a lot more positive, I think, you know, for in terms of messaging, like Dhruva was pointing out. I mean, at least from the new, from New Delhi's perspective, it has hit all the right notes in terms of how uh, the momentum of the strategic partnership between Washington and New Delhi, how it's growing and how it anchors their efforts in realizing what is said to be a shared vision for an open and inclusive Indo-Pacific. So uh, that's been a big plus. Um, you know, there's also been a lot of showing of sensitivity, which is a very, very important concern when you're in New Delhi uh, to, you know, India's significant challenges along the line of control. Uh, and then there is, of course, uh, you know, uh, description of India as an engine for regional growth, a uh, provider of net security, like-minded partner and leader in South Asia and the Indian Ocean region. I mean, 
uh though nilanthi made a fair point and i'll come to that uh, quickly but i think you know in many ways it pacifies a lot of the naysaying around the momentum uh, and the understanding in the relationship um it also hits the right note because a lot of times uh, you know when the the document mentions india as a driving force of the quadrilateral security dialogue and you know reiterating support for india's continued rise uh, and regional leadership in terms of messaging is i think uh, is again great because again there's been a lot of you know saying on india step by step sort of incremental approach in terms of alignment with goals uh, of other members of this dialogue uh, and sometimes a lot of the narrative in the west team to have labeled india as the weakest link in the quad so having said all of that i think there is uh, among the strategic community in appreciation that you know there's this, this recognition is really uh, complemented uh, by an appreciation of india's capability or current and potential uh, in how uh, strategic outcomes in the indo pacific are shaped and how the burden sharing is actually carried forward by india uh, i also think a lot of the document builds on uh, like the previous speakers have mentioned uh, you know the us administration previous US administration reiterating sort of a broad and bipartisan consensus on the Indo- importance of the indo pacific and asia security um, uh, and how important it is for the united states and how it envisions anchoring the united states more firmly in it this messaging is important as ruva mentioned i think uh you know because at a time when uh, you know another crisis uh, is unfolding with ukraine and the global stage uh, a lot of people in the region especially in southeast asian nations uh, with whom one has had the opportunity to interact in a lot of workshops have spoken about a lot of nervousness what if in terms of what this means for us attention you know does the us attention shift and you know does that mean a shift from the focus on china or drifting on the uh issue of china now since the strategy was unveiled even as quad foreign ministers met in australia i think there is a certain agreement that among commentators that it's driven home the point that the grouping uh you know of the quad and the united states is a major building block in the strategy and i think there's a lot of reassurance there uh i think i read some criticism as far as the focus on china went but you know i sitting in new delhi i don't think there was any lack of clarity on that aspect i mean you can talk about rhetoric and substance and so on and so forth but i think there is there's enough reference to china's use of economic economic diplomatic military and technological instruments as it pursues a sphere of influence in the indo pacific so these are pretty clear in terms of mentions of coercion and aggression again highlighting you know uh economic coercion against australia the conflict along the line of control with india growing pressure to taiwan where we have already seen an immediate reaction from beijing and tensions in the east and south china sea i think are all addressed so in my point of view you know a lot of well, uh, the talking especially in track to among think tanks and so on and so forth one of the talking points we always come up with is you know uh indo pacific is not a vision of containment but we are building habits of cooperation you know that can help push back against unilateralism so work like collective action etc which basically say that countries in the region are trying to build habits of cooperation which will help uh, you know go beyond the china question and hence endure uh are covered when us says it's a, it's goal in the indo pacific is just not to compete with china but to shape a strategic environment in which it operates building a balance of influence i think in many strategies in india have repeatedly made this point that new delhi is showing its agency in the indo pacific and is basically uh trying to restore the balance of power and hence given its own constraints wants the indo pacific concept to not be a containment strategy because it will not be comfortable with it so i think uh, a lot of that resonates well here so continued mention of the latest work of strong and mutually reinforcing coalitions which allow different countries to pool resources in a flexible manner etc uh, you know again will be music to new delhi years because india's own approach uh, as foreign minister jay shankar has pointed out i think at a think tank event uh, was that indo pacific is uh, you know a very big and complicated region and the right thing to do naturally for countries is to be open to many building blocks in the region instead of seeing shadows so as he makes the case that more platforms you have the more people to work with each other and larger the consensus so that's good so i think that's more or less the message that is gets reinforced and you see fluidity and issue based coalition continuing to dominate this conversation in terms of the indo pacific architecture and i think the document again reinforces 
this line of effort very quickly i don't want to you know sort of bra- bracket issues as convergences or divergences but rather challenges and opportunities i think both speakers mentioned the economic imperative of the indo pacific and i think that's always been the missing puzzle in this conversation so the fact that there's a lot more thought that's gone into it and we can expect a document with a lot more uh, details is is good uh, but you know because that's also welcome from the indian perspective because when we are talking about uh, alternatives viable deliverables especially when india focuses on the immediate neighborhood uh, in terms of quick wind pack projects and so on and so forth that's a step in the right direction uh, you know a lot of reinforcement the goals set out in the quad mandates as ruva mentioned again that's great uh, he tackled trade but i think in terms of connectivity uh, you know again there's a lot a focus on the build back better world initiative you know seen as an alternative to the bri etc offering more transparency and green passage to investment in ports roads and digital infrastructure however i mean how we there will you know we will have to go beyond the rhetoric and see how this actually uh, works on the ground in terms of practical cooperation because how much this resonates with leaders in developing countries especially where bri is already made in roads will have to be uh, thrashed out a lot more and will require more critical thinking nilanti mentioned you know some lacuna in uh, especially in the focus on the indian ocean uh, and i think uh, that's that's a point that has been made uh, fairly well uh, so i think there continues to be you know uh, i think an expectation that an indian oceanal regional strategy that you know articulates short and long term and puts words into action uh ex- how the strategy is going to be executed or in short how you know treat the indian ocean region as a coherent region and you know what are its aims and what kind of support the united states is willing to put forward and show up etc i think that will need to be thrashed out further i think uh, the question of technology uh, dhruva mentioned it uh, and you know i think that's a straining factor we here are trying to you know um, do some work in this arena but i think where the questions of standardization especially in the tech realm are always very tricky uh, because it will require a lot more than rhetoric i think i was reading a study done by the atlantic so which you know went uh, which went into the nitty gritties of what uh, the quad summit was trying to do with you know standardization and critical tech and so on and so forth uh, i think what the point that uh, that research paper made was vital because it said that this is an incomplete picture because there's a lot of growing friction among the members of the core dialogue on several elements like in technology issues such as cross border data flows data privacy payments digital taxation uh, you know competition e-commerce law enforcement etc so you know while banks like india has done many of them now and investment restrictions are powerful they are limited in scope so when you are talking about countering you know spheres of influence by china countering a digital sino sphere on a global basis will require you know getting world netizens to choose non chinese platforms at scale so this is fundamentally a question about competition and power in the global digital economy so i think the strategic imperatives facing Uh, the quad collide with economic goals and sensitivities of individual members and i think this is a case argued very well because it's something we're going to have to live and thrash out with so i'll stop here and we can uh, cover more ground in the q and a thank you shruti for that uh, uh, you know expansive uh, thought span uh, i uh, what what i thought i'll do next is uh, uh, you know pick up a few points from the strategy itself uh, and throw it out Uh, and get our views on it uh, one is of course that the and and i agree with uh, shruti and how these uh, some of the strategy uh, that are mentioned in the document how they're going to play out on the ground and one of the, that is tackling corruption uh, inside countries of the indo pacific i think that's going to be uh, one of the biggest challenge for uh, for the indo pacific alliance to be able to do that um, and the partnership uh, but uh, more fundamentally i think i want to uh, get all of your views on uh, the timing itself you know that uh, and link it with the quad uh, meeting that happened uh, secretary tony blinken was here uh, and you know the emphasis of the document that the indo pacific strategy of the us is going to emphasize is going to equally uh, look at all the corners of the indo pacific and i think that's why the timing of having a, a hot eurasian border 
uh, and still sending, uh, bringing out the document uh, right then, um, sends, uh, tried to send a signal that they are, the Indo-Pacific is not, uh, the focus on, uh, Indo, uh, on, on Eurasia is not at the cost of Indo-Pacific. But the, an important element that was mentioned in the document was bridging the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific. And I saw some of the debates going on, including one where Dhruva had commented. So Dhruva, can I, if I can bring you uh, on uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy, trying to bridge the Euro-Atlantic with the Indo-Pacific, what are the challenges, especially with the background of the Ukrainian crisis uh, and the next Quad summit, will there be more pressure on India to be able to bring out something in the joint statement uh, around Ukraine or uh, yeah. Eurasian uh, yeah so I think uh, uh, two things one just on the time you know what you mentioned on the timing I, I again I, I don't know all the inside details but I suspect it was actually some not as well thought through as it should have been which is um, I think they you know ideally they would have wanted to have the White House would have wanted to have a national security strategy out within the first year the Trump administration did do that um, and uh, they, they haven't, in part, I suspect, because they've been derailed by a number of crises, Afghanistan previously, now um, uh, uh, Ukraine and, and other things that have occupied a, a lot of bandwidth. Um, and so I think in the interim, putting out this Indo-Pacific strategy was, was necessary and had need to be pushed through. Um, uh, they didn't want it to overshadow um, uh, uh, the Quad Summit, it's, uh, the Quad Meeting itself in, in Australia. Uh, so they didn't bring it out before that or, or during it, uh, but they also wanted it to be done when uh, Secretary Blinken was in uh, the Pacific. And so they brought it out very strangely on a Friday afternoon in Washington when nobody was paying attention. So unfortunately, I think it was like a, a, one of those things where it, it wasn't as well thought through <laughs> the timing and, and all of that. Uh, it should have been a bit more uh, well thought through, but uh, events have, have uh, um, sort of overtaken, it's been overtaken a little bit by events, including uh, crises that are outside the control of um, the people involved. So again, I, I wish it had all been a bit more smooth, but such is the way of um, bureaucratic politics. Uh, on uh, the, the Euro-Atlantic bit, uh, look, I, I think two things. One is, I read it. I read those uh, references in the Indo-Pacific as quite clearly, we would like Europe to play a bigger role in the Indo-Pacific, and we're willing to work with European partners and allies in that effort, and we welcome the the you know the Indo-Pacific strategies and. Uh, posture changes, particularly on the part, of the, the tilt on the part of the UK, um, the, the strategies on part of France, Germany, Netherlands, the European Union, um, and we'd like to see more and work with you more. So I, I, I think I, I read it purely in that way. Uh, I think there's a separate, somewhat related point to it, which is, well, does, does it go the other way as well? Are you expecting allies in, and partners in the Indo-Pacific to play a bigger role in the European uh, theatre? And I think certainly Japan and Australia, uh, I mean, the, the, today there's a G7 meeting, uh, Japan, which Japan is part of on, on Ukraine. Uh, Japan and Australia are both treaty allies of the US. And so I think there is an expectation uh, of, of uh, working, whether it's on sanctions against Russia or um, uh, even operationally uh, in the Far East. Um, that I think is a bit more complicated with India. I don't think you know, there's an, a necessarily either an expectation that India play a similar role with respect to Russia-related contingencies, given the India-Russia relationship. Uh, nor, uh, but, but you know, that being said, I think it will sort of, uh, particularly amongst people outside of government, that will color the view of India as a as a partner and ally. So we'll have to see how the next few months go in that respect. Uh, uh, again, I'm not, I don't know, but I suspect there's been over the last few months there's been a lot of talk about. Um, uh, uh, about this very issue, you know, what 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 role, what interest does India have uh, in uh, in in Europe, uh, including in, in Ukraine, uh, quite quite specifically. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I would imagine that uh, sort of very clear lines have been drawn, which is sort of these are areas where uh, India does have have interests and have concerns, and these are other areas where, because of the importance of the India Russia defense relationship in particular. Uh, where you you know you won't see India playing a role that the U.S. expects of a lot of allies, uh, particularly especially European allies, but also some of its Indo-Pacific allies. And so I think clarity on that score would, would certainly would certainly help, um, uh, particularly if it is communicated privately uh, between the various actors. Uh, one final point: there are a lot of concerns um, about how much the Ukraine crisis, in particular, will distract the U.S. from uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, theater. I think certainly, at least in the, in the very near future, now that the sort of war has started on a very expansive scale uh, as of yesterday, 
as of today, um, that uh, the, there will be a lot more policy attention on the part of Washington focused on, on Ukraine and on Europe. Uh, I think there's no doubt about that, particularly at the highest levels. Um, however, I don't think that will necessarily have a big implication, particularly militarily. It's not as if the U.S. plans are moving large assets from the Indo-Pacific to Europe. Ukraine is not uh, is not subject to a, a security guarantee. So, you know, in the in the sort of medium to long term, I don't see that much changing in that respect. Uh, but uh, in the short term, certainly there will be uh, more attention focused. There, uh, there has been a lot of talk about sort of twin crises, particularly one involving in Taiwan Straits contingency, but we'll have to see what, what happens on that score. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll quickly follow up with a very uh, quick question, uh, you know, about the, re, you know, one of the implementation strategies of the action plan uh, in, in the document is and reinforcing deterrence on Taiwan. Uh, and, and that really uh, sort of uh, basically asserts the same point that uh, the Indo-Pacific in the Indo-Pacific, Taiwan is going to be very important. Uh, but given the United States' uh, constrictions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Ukrainian crisis and its uh, ability um, or the lack of it to be able to fully deploy or um, uh, back Ukraine, uh, do you think that will that'll dent the whole idea of Taiwan's defense in the Indo-Pacific? I mean, I, it's hard to see uh, a direct link. You know, uh, Taiwan is subject is 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 much more complicated. The U.S. is much more involved. It has, um, you know, uh, it, it, it is very different. I, I, I would say so. The the better scenario is actually reinforcing not um, uh, Ukraine per se, but uh, the Baltic states and Poland and others where the you know the U.S. does have a security guarantee, where the U.S. does have a presence of some kind. Um, and so I think the parallels are are, are clearer there. Um, so I'm not sure it would necessarily mean like, you know, just because the U.S. is unable to, uh, uh, it, to provide the same security commitment to Ukraine, therefore its commitment to Taiwan is, is any less or more. Uh, I think they're two very different uh, theaters with, with their own, uh, you know, different commitments, different kinds of um, capabilities that the U.S. has in both areas. Thanks. Shruti, let me uh, turn to you and uh, get your views on the... Uh, uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the implementation of one of the implementation strategies, which is strengthening an empowered and unified ASEAN. Uh, I think if you also look at, uh, look at it in connection with the Quad statement, there's a lot of emphasis on the role of ASEAN, uh, where they're trying to uh, uh, get ASEAN to, to mediate in, in matters like uh, the Myanmar crisis. Uh, so how do you see the ASEAN centrality, the, uh, the importance of ASEAN centrality within the Indo-Pacific in Biden administration's uh, document? Um, Vivek, I think if you're being honest, uh, all of us in our assessments have often point out, pointed out that while uh, ASEAN centrality has always been uh, in, spoken about at length in most of the strategy documents of countries involved, uh, often uh, it's seen without much substance because, you know, uh, ASEAN centrality in many countries' opinions is a double-edged sword given China's influence uh, uh, over the unit. However, uh, since the quadrilateral dialogue and, you know, we've started talking about, you know, non-traditional security issues like the vaccine partnership and so on and so forth, I had made the case previously that... Uh, rising multilateralism in the region, uh, especially with the what COD uh, has set out to achieve, could give uh, or persuade ASEAN countries in the region to look at uh, commitments in the Indo-Pacific more realistically, because uh, as we many speakers have pointed out before, and we've had discussions on this, still the economic logic of the Indo-Pacific is sorted out. Uh, uh, you know, the we haven't much got much to show uh, to ASEAN, who's already walking uh, on such a tight rope. So I think uh, incrementally, if we start to deliver on some of the promises that we've done in various uh, coalitions of the willing, ASEAN centrality will have uh, more meat to it than just pure rhetoric. Thank you. Uh, Nilanti, let, uh, let me turn to you and um, talk about, you know, partnering to build resilience in the Pacific Islands. I think you talked about, uh, you know, small little 
islands and, and about the conception of Pacific theater being uh, still being uh, the lens through which the U.S. views the Indo-Pacific. Uh, in, in terms of small little islands where China is gaining influence, uh, how is U.S. looking at the whole region uh, to be able to, is, is that the primary um, focus of the U.S. to to behind this whole idea of building resilience uh, among the Pacific Islands. And also, we, we also find uh, quite a mention of South, South and Southeast Asia in, in, in the document. So if you can sum up uh, and, and find a reason for us uh, in the document. Sure, Vivek. Yeah, I, I think this really stems from this issue of U.S. identity and, and how it engages the region. And just historically, not just only through history with U.S. presence in Asia going back over a century, uh, but also by virtue of geography, the U.S. is a Pacific nation. Um, just looking at the states, um, of, of course, uh, territories. Uh, so I, I there's definitely that focus on resilience. I, I think it, it is legitimate, uh, just as Shruti was mentioning as a non-traditional security issue. I think there is significant concern about some of the impacts of climate change and uh, sea levels and uh, flooding in, in the Pacific Islands. Uh, but I also think it, it really stems from the U.S. engagement with the region uh, because it is a Pacific nation. And it, it for me, it really gets back to an issue of identity. Uh, so it's it's been fascinating to see really an expansion of that identity, as we've seen with this most recent Indo-Pacific strategy. And you can see a little bit of it in the previous administration, uh, when, when now the U.S. is talking about being an Indo-Pacific power. Uh, so I think that transition is important. Uh, but it also reflects the this increasing focus of the U.S. on non-traditional security issues. So uh, I think that building that type of resilience uh, against natural disasters and the, the impacts of climate change, I think, is, is also a, a sincere focus of, of, of the U.S. government, from what I've seen. Thank you. Um, and now it's it, it's open to uh, any of you who want to intervene. Um, you know, the implementation implementation strategy points out 12 to 24 months uh, of intensive focus uh, for implementing what they call about 10 action plans. Uh, in, in the same light, uh, how do you assess uh, such a power packed two years, uh, one year to two year span of implementing this grand strategy um, with a new vision that vision promises? Uh, what are going to be the challenges? And of course, lastly, do you see any gaps uh, in, the, in the document in the sense that uh, from a larger assessment of the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, something that Biden administration missed uh, could have included um, and or emphasized, underscored, etc. So, starting with uh, any any of you, I mean, it's open to any of you who want to take this up. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm happy to let others go. Uh, I think, but I mean, if, if, if you need somebody to start, I I, I look. I, I think uh, I think you have to give credit to the Biden administration for some things, and in, in the past year, in, in some ways, they've exceeded expectations as to what. They could have done in the Indo-Pacific. They've elevated the Quad. They've got. They've given it some, uh, some, some. You know, true bureaucratic and and uh, muscle. Uh, they've you know working groups working on very specific items and delivery of those items, starting with the vaccine initiative, uh, but but now going into a number of areas. I mean, a very wide ar array of, uh, of domains of, of cooperation. Some of some of which will probably work out better than others. Um, they've done AUKUS. Um, so, I mean, again, for a first year of a new administration, on, on, at least on that, they've, they've done very well. And if they can sustain this momentum for the next two, one, even one or two years, that would be quite significant. Uh, now, again, I think the, 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 the larger systemic problems, and it's nothing to do with the strategy per se, I think it, it, it's very good in outlining goals and objectives. And, you know, it, it, it struck the right tone in many respects. I think we, we all agree uh, about that. I think there's still uh, concerns uh, over the long term, particularly about what kind of assets and how the U.S. can play to its strengths in the region. And I'll give you a few examples of where the shortfalls. I mean, there's serious concerns about the Navy, and and uh, this is, I mean, it's not unique to U.S. We have similar concerns in India, but sort of uh, is your Navy appropriately um, equipped? Uh, uh, you know, has it got the budgetary allocations, the assets, the capabilities? To, to do what is required in the next few years. And again, naval warfare is changing so rapidly. 
um, that uh, I think there's serious questions about on, on, on that score. Um, there was just an article just yesterday, uh, day before Foreign Affairs by Corey Shakia on, on the subject. Um, so uh, that, that I think remains an, a, a big question, whether, you know, whether the Navy, I mean, there have been a number of very high profile, uh, uh, some, some bad press that the US Navy has faced for a number of reasons, you know, including losing a F-35 in an accident um, uh, recently in the South China Sea. Uh, but that's just one after an, a number of other uh, incidents like that. So really, I think that there's serious concerns about that. Second is uh, the US uh, ability to uh, pretty US government's ability to marshal overseas financing in a strategic way. And again, the, a similar concern in India, you know, you have a lot of private sector funds, which is often more risk averse, doesn't want to go into markets, you know, whereas China and to a lesser degree, Japan are able to move into more vulnerable, um, high risk uh, markets, capture, in some cases, capture those markets um, and, and uh, use it, you know, be, use it very strategically in that sense. Uh, the U.S. is still limited for all that. Uh, there, there are tools like DFC and other things, but it's it's not yet at the level that one would uh, expect for the Indo-Pacific. There's still a, a great risk averseness and a lack of sensitization uh, amongst the U.S. private sector. So I think coordinating between the government and private sector on the Indo-Pacific is a major gap. Um, the third one, as I mentioned, is was uh, is on the on the trade side. Um, and then finally, also, even on the technology side, where I think they, they, there's been significant progress and, and better understanding of it, again, most of the technology is in the hands of the U.S. private sector. And I think Silicon Valley has moved a little bit better, uh, has become a bit more sensitive to some of the strategic and political concerns uh, over the last few years uh, emanating from China, amongst other places, uh, compared to, say, Wall Street and the financial community. But this still is a, a long way to go to to fully sensitize the U.S. private sector about the sensitivity of some of those technologies, the kind of tech arms race that is taking place and so forth. A quick follow up uh, on the market access bit. I think when I was going through the document, one thing that struck me was the language uh, that to, that that reflected that there's going to be a very competitive network of Indo-Pacific uh, economies which is uh, in, in, you know, in, in very layman's terms, going to keep companies like Huawei out. Um, so do you think there's going to be um, issues about that at the WTO, uh, uh, you know, cutting the competitiveness of, of companies of other countries? Uh, building a network, uh, building a network of, of Indo-Pacific countries to keep out some of the companies, uh, some of the global companies, which of course have their issues. But uh, Dhruva, since you talk about uh, market access, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know about the, the, the details of, you know, um, I'm sure it'll be contested, but you know, there are a lot of national security carve outs in, in WTO negotiations. And I, I suspect that they have been used. Uh, I mean, uh, Trump used them on, on the question of steel uh, tariffs, for example. So I, I think it, you can make a national security case for essentially discrimination against a company, particularly if you can, you know, make the case, and I think a strong case can be made of ties between that company and, and another competitive, you know, another a, a a competing country's government. Um, so again, it, it, some of this will be disputed in places at, like the WTO, but uh, I suspect national security grounds will be used for a lot more in the years to come. Um, India has used you know, using it, the U.S. is, China is using it, uh, others will. But, I mean, that, that, that paints a very uh, grim picture for the global trading order in the future. Thanks. Uh, Shruti, if I can uh, come to you, uh, on the, you've been writing on AUKUS, and, and so uh, uh, given that the document focuses on, on you know, strong Pacific theater, uh, you know, going forward, and, and also mentions AUKUS as a very strong arm of it. Uh, how do you think the balancing is going to be uh, in, in India? Of course, there is great degree of enthusiasm that, uh, you know, it su supplements the quad. There is some truth to that. Uh, but the United States per se and Indo-Pacific document uh, are trying to keep the two things separate of, of uh, Indo-Pacific strategy and AUKUS uh, in the sense, particularly from an Indian perspective. Um, how do you see that um, amalgamation happening or not? Uh, do you think India is going to remain uh, outside the whole conception of AUKUS, uh, even partially, or Quad is going to have some connection with it at some... Uh, of course, it's a crystal ball question, but as per the document, how do you see that? 
Hi, I'm sorry. You guys are frozen, so pardon my uh, if I'm not sounding great. But the uh, I think that's a great question. But I I think India, you know, I don't think we've been superficial when you know our uh, when the uh, when the foreign secretary or the foreign minister is talking about open openness and you know being open to various building blocks in the Indo Pacific. Because quite frankly, we have our own concerns and. Uh, the first would be to get the immediate neighborhood uh, and our you know status as the first responder in the region in order so i mean yes there's a larger debate how comfortable are we with it i think there's a strong uh, uh, security conversation within the quad which handles all, all of the concerns both divergences and convergences between countries in the region so i think that's been handled so my short answer to your question would be i think you know uh india has been fairly clear that you know we have we have a uh, border which is now open both the continental and we have a lot of activity in our uh, maritime theater as well so if buffering capacity uh, will help keep our concerns at bay we are more than welcome uh, we are welcoming such efforts so i don't see that uh, as at at odds with what we are doing i think it's reinforced a lot of what has already been discussed Thank you, Shruti. Uh, Nilanti, if I can get your views on uh, the the Western, the Indian Ocean as a whole, um, although it finds just a couple of mentions in the whole document, but I think the larger narrative uh, links uh, what is happening in the Indian Ocean to the whole strategy. Uh, but if I may bring your attention to the Western Indian Ocean, where India is trying to um, step up, uh, both in the in the Arabian Sea, um, be it Uh, be it near the gulf or the african coast um how do you see the uh, the net security provider role of of india uh tying up with biden administration's uh strategy focus this time sure um i as you mentioned uh, you you were talking about omissions in, in the document and and i was struck by really the the omission of the indian ocean in the region just just really just those only two two mentions uh, of the discrete indian ocean theater uh, perhaps that's deliberate perhaps that that is in an attempt to really focus on the wider indo pacific con- context but it it's noteworthy uh, but i think for your question uh, that that mention of supporting india and really its its regional leadership i think that that covers essentially that that focus on uh thinking about the Indi- about india and its role as as a, a us major defense partner and given the fact that india has expanded its vision of its own uh primary area of interest to cover the entire indian ocean and and really stretch the the boundaries all the way to the the western indian ocean i think that that only helps reinforce it, india india's leadership and and all of its attention particularly through its naval arm uh to uh, capacity building and initiatives and its uh, uh mission based deployments and and operating 24/7 in in the Indian Ocean. Uh I did have a, a one follow up to the the previous discussion. Uh I think uh, uh, Druva made me an excellent point um uh, about the the DFC as a tool. Uh so get, getting back to your question Vivek about omissions. I I I was kind of waiting to see uh the mention of the the DFC in the document so I, I was surprised but by, by its absence particularly because in the the previous national security strategy there was this mention about emphasizing how the US needs to modernize its development finance tools uh so i i was i was just surprised by by that uh the absence of of the dfc there um and and then shruti i made an excellent point about the importance of connectivity and really getting back to uh ha- how the US is is going to try to advance those initiatives uh and then related Vivek you made that comment about the corruption and i think that's particularly important as the US approaches the region and thinks about ways to help advance connectivity so uh whether it's with uh the DFC or the Millennium uh a challenge corporation there there have been some issues there uh like we've seen with uh Nepal and Sri Lanka and this issue of corruption is a particular one that that really uh kind of uh ties a uh, US uh, what the US can do 
uh, because there are there's legislation like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that that really uh, limits what U.S. businesses are are allowed to do. Where you know, unlike some other countries, so I think that's those are all just really excellent points about corruption uh, and connectivity, and really thinking about what are what are the concrete tools how how the U.S. can can improve can can approach the region and, and try to advance it, but but also the limitations as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a quick follow-up, Nilanti, on, you know, you mentioned some of the smaller islands like Sri Lanka. Um, I may have missed it, but uh, how much does the document really focus on the smaller islands of the Indian Ocean? Uh, they have mentioned quite a few in the Pacific Theater and Southeast Asia. But in terms of Indian Ocean, uh, do you find that uh, what's the extent of mention or accommodation of these islands in part of the strategy? Yeah, essentially, uh, this this gets back to my point about really the the absence of, of mentioning the Indian Ocean and really putting the the focus on India uh, when it comes to thinking about the Indian Ocean. So yeah, when, when you see islands mentioned, it's it's really in the context of the Pacific Islands, and, and I think this really stems in part due to the the U.S.'s Pacific identity, calling itself a Pacific nation, and really how it approaches the Indo-Pacific, which I, I argue is is really through a Pacific. Lens. Thank you. Taking off from there, I think, uh, you know, that there has been this debate about uh, excessive focus on the maritime domain in the uh, conception of Indo-Pacific. Uh, and Dhruva, I know you've, you've been somebody who's, who's countered that view often. Uh, so in, in that sense, really amalgamating uh, a continental and a maritime view together in, in the conception of the Indo-Pacific, do you think this strategy uh, sort of zooms out from the maritime domain and, and focuses and makes it more comprehensive uh, and much more achievable, uh, if at all. I mean, I, look, I think the, the, the I, you know, uh, I, I think the point I, made, I, I make repeatedly, I think, is that uh, the Indo-Pacific, you know, whether it's from an Indian conception or U.S. conception, obviously focus, is meant to focus more on the maritime domain and defining the, the region by its oceans, uh, I think there's clearly an understanding that both from a security and a commercial point of view, the you know the the, the oceans are really going to define the the future of the, of the region, the, the the prosperity and the security of the region. That being said, I don't think it's done at the complete you know that that suggests abdicating a role in the continental space. And you can see uh, the, the problem is at some point it gets so unwieldy that uh, you know the central asia fall under the indo-pacific does mongolia fall under the indo-pacific but uh, that that i think that that's that there's you know there's already a concern that again whether it's the us or india has, has bitten off more than it can chew with the indo-pacific this is so i think that, that that but i think it's a very narrow conception to say well just because you're talking about the indo-pacific you're somehow ceding the the continental space again nepal was the mcc project was often touted as one of the uh, sort of a case example of uh, the U.S. engage economic engagement with the region. Uh, getting to the point on on the uh, the Indian Ocean, uh, you know, I think why what is intriguing about it, the big challenge in some ways, is that west of Singapore, both the U.S. and China are still constrained in terms of how they can uh, deploy military assets. Uh, which is, if you look at the, I mean, Nilanti has, has focused a lot more, amongst others, has focused a lot more on this. But you know, if you look at the Bay of Bengal. You really have three, you know, India, and Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar, and, and Indonesia, just a little bit of Thailand, but in Indonesia. And these are all countries that are, are going to make it very difficult for a variety of reasons for either the US or China to play a big military role there. Um, so I think the competition then moves to two places. One is the central Indian Ocean, uh, which really is about four island states, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Nepal, uh, Mauritius, and Seychelles. And uh, which is why I think the question of Diego Garcia will be a very interesting one in the years ahead, uh, particularly for both the U.S. and India, uh, but also the fate of Sri Lanka as well and its its economic dependence and and, and so forth. Um, so you know I think that, that that's one place to look, which is sort of is there a militarization underway of these um, these four countries? What kind of engagements India has certainly tried to engage all all four of those in, in different ways, including providing military assistance. Um, but for the US, like in some ways, all its chips are currently in on Diego Garcia. Um, the, that, that gets to the Western Indian Ocean, which is much more contested, where the US has a major naval presence in the Gulf, in Bahrain particularly, uh, it has a smaller presence in Djibouti. 
Um, and but again, largely focused on West Asia, Middle East, and to some degree Af- East Africa scenarios rather than Indo-Pacific scenarios. Interestingly enough, China also is very focused there. So if you look at places where the China, the PLA Navy is most active out west of Singapore, it is Karachi, Djibouti, where they have a a, a base. Uh, Aden, Salala, Oman, uh, Je- Jeddah, and Saudi Arabia, but it's a pre- it's a very small handful of of places. And so again, the the when you look at it that way, if you look at if you sort of map it out geographically, the role of India then becomes very central because India is in some ways this big, uh, almost a lot massive island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, uh, and uh, in some ways I think that it becomes quite self explanatory why India emerges as such a big partner. In the Indian Ocean, and also kind of paradoxically, why the Indian Ocean doesn't get as much of a mention, perhaps, in the U.S. strategy. And there's this sort of ambivalence about looking at the Western Indian Ocean as part of the Indo-Pacific theater, or as part of a Middle East theater, or sort of some combination there of, of both. Um, so I, 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 I think it is interesting looking at sort of if if this region is to become militarized, and given China's shipbuilding, there is every expectation that it will become more militarized. What does that actually look like in practice? And I think again, this dispels the the, the U.S. concern about overextension to the Indian Ocean, um, the, the the questions about the seams and, and geography of, of uh, deployment, and the role of India all kind of come out if you if you look at things this way. Thank you. I what I'll uh, Shruti. I think sitting in New Delhi, I think I uh, ought to ask you this question about uh, track two dialogues. And I, I also see the, the Quad joint statement in consonance with the Indo-Pacific policy. Uh, and as a, a strong uh, point made there uh, is that you the track two dialogues will be a very important uh, part of India-US relationship. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of indo and, and we've already seen uh, Indo-Pacific circle uh, being, uh, being part of it, which is now in New Delhi. Uh, was was supported was inaugurated by people from state department uh, so how do you, how uh, how important do you think in terms of india us per se connectivity track 2 is going to uh, be important because we we are also under the debate uh, and I, I i could be corrected here that track 1 these days have raced ahead of track 2 so what what are your thoughts on this Vivek, i think uh... All conversations are important, whether track one or track two. I think I think we've come a long way. If you uh, if you see the official press statement uh, after the foreign minister and uh, Secretary State Blinken's meeting, it said that India and the U.S. discussed all issues, including tough talk, tough issues like Ukraine, and both sides exchanged their uh, you know ideas on it, and it was an open communication and so on and so forth. I mean, this is interesting because uh, a few days ago we had uh, an informal meeting with some U.S. officials in New Delhi and, you know, they were saying that, uh, you know, we are very, very, un- very understanding of the Indian position uh, in the unfolding crisis in Europe and uh, it's because we understand uh, India is acting in self-interest and, you know, and so on and so forth and it's an evolving position. So these, these, these conversations are uh, interesting because it shows that both sides are developing, uh, you know, a good back and forth between each other. And I think as if think tanks and academics can come into that and, you know, uh, contribute to putting more, more ideas on the table and uh, offering more hope and solutions in terms of uh, shared challenges, I think it's always great. So, yeah, we need to talk more and act more perhaps, but talk more. Differently. Thank you, Shruti. I, I just wanted to round off the discussion. We've completed one hour um, with this question because I see in the future... Uh, with the with the tone of the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, going on the lines of of um, or the Quad building on the lines, I mean they're mutually um, uh, supplementing each other. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for uh, breaking down the parts of Indo-Pacific strategy of the Biden administration. I wish we had more time to be able to uh, read more between the lines, uh, but I think we've touched on major points, gaps. Um, so thank you again. Uh, thank you so much for for your time. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.